Okay. Um, a very good morning to everyone, and welcome to the Climate Change Impact Mitigation and Adaptation um, Session, and thanks for coming. Um, as you all know, climate change now has become uh, like a fact in our life. Even the lay person uh, knows now about climate change and its impact. Um, climate change now affects uh, most of all uh, the sectors uh, across the world, and uh, the water sector uh, is also affected. Um, it changes in uh, rainfall pattern and the reduction of uh, agricultural productivity and uh, impact on other sectors as well. Uh, climate change, um, yes, it, it, challenges, it challenges us, but also it's got opportunities that we need to benefit uh, from. And um, today we have a number of keynote speakers uh, who will share their experiences with us. Uh, those experiences are from um, a number of uh, countries across uh, the world. Uh, we hope that we all benefit from uh, those uh, experiences and uh, they can be uh, replicated um, somewhere else. Uh, the program today is a heavy one. Uh, we have six presenters uh, from the UK, Morocco, Netherlands, and the World Meteorological Organization, France, and the US. Um, we start with uh, Professor Ragab Ragab, uh, a principal hydrologist and water resources management specialist at the Center for Ecology and Hydrology, uh, the UK. He is also the former president of the International Commission on Irrigation and the Rich ICID, and he holds a PhD in water uh, infiltration um, in soils uh, from uh, Belgium. So, uh, Dr. Ragab, please. and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I would like to thank the organizing committee for really inviting me to give this presentation. I will talk about the climate change, but from the prospects of really uh, the effects on our hydrology in the UK. The climate change actually has impact on crops, food, ecosystems, and the one I'll be talking about extreme events, the floods and the droughts, and in particular, I'll be talking about the impact on the droughts as the, as the climate change shows us here that we are expecting actually rising intensity of storms, forest fires, droughts, and flood. In 1976, we had really a quite a severe drought, especially the people in London, they had to go uh, to get water from standpipes. And that's the most recent memory in the history of UK. But if we go back to the history from 1800 onwards, UK was subjected to drought events. But these drought events, as you see there, is coming now more frequently. And that's actually triggered the, the attention of the UK, also pressure from us as a researcher, to give the drought as importance as the flood. And I, I kept saying that the economic cost of the drought by far more than the flood. The flood is local, but when the drought comes, it is regional or continental at some stages. Um, this is the standing pipes of 1976, the recent memory, where people really in London, they, uh, they had to go to the street to get some water. In, 19, in 2003 and 2006, uh, we also faced some reservoirs became dry, as, as you see here in that picture, where the reservoir manager actually is sitting on the bed of the reservoir. And in 2012, also we got another drought. And you can see here in the map that the deficiency of the rainfall in the south and southeast went actually down to almost 50%. So we had really 50% deficiency. Then. We also looked at the inundation, and there are seven sites in the UK, low, co low coastal areas are very vulnerable to seawater inundation. With the help of the Met Office, I carried on a project on studying the impact of the seawater inundation 
especially in, in, in those seven sites and the impact on vegetation. But that's another lecture, really. The, the project I, I, I got from the government was to look at the drought across the whole UK. I selected seven catchments from Scotland all the way to Cornwall in the south. And those, they represent a gradient in the rainfall, decreasing rainfall from north to south, and also from east to west. Those seven catchments, they, they, they differ in size between 300 to close to 600 kilometers square. And then well, I applied the integrated hydrological modeling system, which is three models. The top model is the distribute catchment scale model by CASM. And the output from there as a recharge would go into the mod flow model which through interface. And the flow, um, the groundwater flow and the groundwater level of the mod flow would feed into seawater intrusion, which is the third model. So any abstraction of any water management on the surface would actually feed into the seawater intrusion issue at the coastal areas. But these models they work independently, but they can also work there separately. Uh, we had a stakeholders group from Environment Agency to Farmers Union to National Trusts and all about those 20 stakeholders involved in that uh, project. The project was about 7 million. My share of the 7 million was about 2 million to carry on this, uh, this study on the seven catchments. The study was not only modeling, but also we used the mesocosmic experiment, out shelters. And these out shelters, we, we actually have roofs, and these roofs would actually allow a certain amount of rainfall to mimic the percentage of rainfall we expect from one scenario, uh, especially the, uh, the middle um, or mid emission or medium emission level. Also, a colleague of mine, Ivan, uh, was doing some meso experiments in the greenhouse, looking at a drought crops, and like quinoa, for example, and another durum wheat, and also lucerne, which is something like uh, bersim or clover, to see the drought tolerance of these crops. The, in the modeling side, which I'll talk about mostly, is that we have the, the hydrological model, and then we, the, first, the first thing we do is we calibrate the model against the stream flow. And that's what you see on the left side. And, and the model calibration, when it's successful, is followed by a model validation for a longer period. The data we had from 16, 1961 to 2012. And once we have that trust, the model validation gives us a Nash Sutcliffe efficiency factor for the stream flow high enough. Then we put the model for test with climate change scenarios. The, the UK CP09, which is a climate change scenarios, uh, can give us data in two formats. One is the, uh, the probability, joint probability, the relation between rainfall and temperature, and the other one, weather generator, where we can have temperature, rainfall, sunshine, and, and uh, vapor pressure on a daily basis. And then from that, actually, we can see the impact of these scenarios on the stream flow, groundwater recharge, potential and action evaporation, and the drought risk as well. And we do also the same thing with land use change. The, the model, actually, we use rainfall climate data distributed or lumped, land cover soil series, map as well, elevation and elevation map, land cover properties, soil properties, and data on abstraction, irrigation, or uh, discharge. This is one of the catchment. I'm not going to talk about the seven catchment. This is the Don catchment, if you have been to UK. Uh, there, actually, in, in, at the south there, Sheffield. And if you know Sheffield University, is located there. And we distribute, actually, the, the catchment into squares. Each square is one kilometer square. And the model calculates from the elevation, the position, and the location of the, uh, the tributes of the Dun River in that catchment. And this is the, the interface uh, with the model. That model, about the, that area or that catchment, about 430 kilometers square. Then the calibration I, I used here, a dry year, which is 2011, followed by uh, an average year, 2012, to see if the model can cope with a dry year as well as a wet year. And you can see here we got an Nash Sutcliffe efficiency factor or goodness, effect, goodness of, fit, of fit factor 
about 91.5%, which is quite high value. Then we put that into validation to different periods of the stream flow, and also we managed to get above 80% Nash Sutcliffe uh, efficiency factor. And then we became now confident that the model is able to produce the stream flow at reasonable uh, accuracy. We have been looking at standardized precipitation index over the years, and also standardized precipitation evaporation index that takes into account the evaporation. And we were trying to see if these actually uh, values would reproduce the drought of 1976, the famous drought, as well as the 90s and 2012 as well. And you can see here that below the average, you can see that 1976 is, if I can use the pointer, this is 19, the 1976 here shows really a quiet drought time, and here the 90s and then 2012. So we were able to reproduce the historic or the recent historic droughts. We did the same thing with another indicator for drought, the Renaissance Drought Index. And that Renaissance Drought Index is calculated as a sum of the rainfall divided by the sum of evapotranspiration. And also here we, we, sh we should be able to see in 1976 it was really severe drought as well as the 90s as well, the drought that came to the UK. But the, the, the Renaissance, uh, the, recon the reconnaissance drought index, uh, we also calculated it instead of potential evapotranspiration and, and total rainfall, we calculated using the net rainfall after taking away the rainfall intercepted by the canopy and also the actual evaporation instead of potential evapotranspiration and you can see the difference between the two. And we tried to look at the soil motion deficit also at that period of the famous drought and you can see here the extremely dry 76 the soil motion deficit is high, and that's important because if you have soil motion deficit high enough, you wouldn't generate runoff or even uh, recharge. And also, I always a uh, uh, fan of using scaled soil moisture, the wetness index. The wetness index is scaled soil moisture, and from zero to one, zero it means the catchment at a minimum soil moisture, and one it means the catchment at the maximum soil moisture that actually helps us to uh, uh, not to account for the changes for in vegetation or elevation. So you can compare uh, some sites, although they have different elevation, although they have different vegetation. And, and also, I'm not really sure if I can uh, run that animation, but, but here, this is 76, that the stakeholders, they like to, to see some sort of uh, animation to, to look at the rainfall, and uh, how the other uh, elements of the water balance would react. Not very really sure if it's going to work on this computer. Uh, never mind, it's not going to work here. There's no media, apparently. So uh, now we, we can go into the ap application of the scenarios. The scenarios, the joint probability, the, the, the possible increase in rainfall and temperature, and also the weather generator daily data. And we selected uh, high emission, mm. low emission, and the medium emission scenario. And we selected also three periods uh, from 2010 to 2039, we call it the 2020s, and the 2050s and 2080s. And we used the Hadley Center in the UK with an array of models, but we used really the model that suits us. And this is the joint probability uh, uh, diagram where we, the, the inner circle is the one that was the highest probability that's very likely that will have that increase in temperature versus that increase or decrease in the rainfall. And that's one of the things. The, we get the, the, the values at one at uh, one grid square of 25 by 25, and, they, and we disaggregate that to the catchment. And, and here, if you, if you look at what comes from joint probability, if you look at the winter time, uh, here it's uh, the increase in temperature in, in the red, 1.3 to 2 to 2.4, and the rainfall to 4.7, 8, and 9.6. That's at the low emission. If you go to the winter time there at the high emission, at, at the very right there, you can see there is increase up to 3.5 degrees, and also you can see there is uh, increase in rainfall by 16.8%. But that's in winter, but in summer, you can see here there is a decrease and the negative values in the rainfall in the summer. 
And the summer is important because the summer is the time we irrigate. And that's very important really for farmers in particular. So we put that into the model and we run the model and this is the, the, uh, the, the results of what we get as a stream flow. The, the blue bars on top there showing there is a slight increase in the stream flow in winter time, but all other seasons will have decrease in the stream flow under all uh, those high or medium or uh, low emission scenarios. But the most, of course, decrease in the stream flow is associated with the summer. The same thing goes the groundwater recharge. The groundwater recharge is also following the same pattern, but we don't have really any increase in the recharge. The reason, although we have more rainfall in winter, and not is not actually equal in the recharge, is because the high temperature and increase in evapotranspiration makes more solid moisture deficit that wouldn't allow that much recharge. And, and here you can see the soil moisture deficit is on the increase, with the highest increase in, in actual high emission scenarios. Wetness index is also decreasing. It means the soil is getting dry, especially with high emission scenarios. And, and also in the, the 80s. Uh, and also you have the potential and actual effect transpiration is also in the increase. That explains why we don't get even recharge in winter time. And then we looked at the drought uh, events, the frequency and the severity level. And if you look at the, basic, the baseline, 1961 to 1990, if you look at the number of the droughts, five minutes, okay. look at the number of the droughts here. Now, now you have two uh, moderate and one severe and one extra extreme. So there are in total four. Now if you look at the far end, how many actually a drought event? There we have about four moderate, and then you have two severe and extreme. So in total, you have now about eight. That's double of the number of the drought events. And that's really what we uh, show to the, the local authority. The, the results of, of that indicates that the CP09 projected more rain in winter, but reduced rain in summer. However, the increase in winter rain did not produce similar increase in stream flow uh, and groundwater recharge. Modern results indicated a decrease in summer river flows, groundwater recharge, with time and was increasing the level, emission level. The severity and frequency of drought events will significantly increase, will significantly increase with time and emission level in all catchments. All the applied drought indices uh, indicated that there's increase in the severity and the drought with time and emission scenarios. When it comes to the land use change, we actually, running that with the model, we got to the point that increasing broadleaf uh, woodland area reduces the river flow and the groundwater recharge, but increases evapotranspiration. And increasing hazard or grass or crops area by replacing trees would increase river flows and groundwater recharge. But we found the impact of the climate change by far exceeds the impact of the land use change in that particular catchment. Now, the, the other part we did, the uncertainty level, because everyone would say how much I can trust the results. So we run the uncertainty level on the stream flow. And the uncertainty level based on the generalized likelihood uncertainty estimation glue. And we have some, something we call a containment ratio, how much actually of the observation data is contained in the envelope of predictions. If it is above 70%, it means you can really trust the model. So this is the graphs of monthly flow and annual flow, and the, uh, the, the containment ratio here, uh, which is the black line. The black line is the measurements, the flow measured. And what you see there, the blue is the calibration period, and the orange is the validation period. And you can see that this, the, the measured flow stays within the envelope of the 95 and 5% per entire uh, weighted uh, probability. And also another way of presenting this uh, probability, the red line here is the measurements or the flow measured, and then the black line is the, the black area, is the envelope within which actually the model prediction is that gives you really an idea that the model was able to produce the stream flow. Now, the most important thing for water companies to work with us in the project, to identify the gap between the future supply and the demand. And we did that in the seven catchments. And we, we supply, the, uh, we calculate the water availability, 
based on the sum of the uh, groundwater and stream flow, uh, but also the, the, the water demand comes from the water companies of each catchment. So you can see in that catchment there's a huge gap uh, between the demand and supply. And the conclusion from the seven catchments that a part of them, the Scotland catchment in Eden in five uh, region, there's a gap, and that gap is widening by time. And now to come to the, the risk and management, we need to, 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 to talk about how can we prepare the, uh, the, the community to, to cope with the climate change and drought in particular. If the, if the community has uh, capability to cope, then the risk would be less. If the, if the community is vulnerable, it means you have elderly and you have more children, you have a vulnerable community, then the risk is high. And then you have to go into yeah, uh, measurements, uh, measures uh, to mitigate, to reduce the, the impact of CO2 and methane and all the causes that makes the, the, the climate change impact on them. And one thing also for farmers here, we try to apply the climate change to see what will the impact on, on the crops. And here we apply that here in one of the crops. And you can see here on the emission scenarios that we have uh, as standard, current standard, the, the season for amaranth was 114 days under the climate change scenarios, 2095 high, it is 98. So there's a 14 days difference. So it means that we are going to have a shorter season and possibly if you are irrigating every day by drip irrigation, you might actually save 14 days of irrigation. And I thank you with that. Thanks so much, Dr. Ragab. Uh, interesting presentation. And I'm sure you have so many questions, but uh, uh, please uh, keep the questions until the end. Um, 